Hello, this is Aiden Scott, Program Manager and Lead Director for EMS University San Antonio. We're now going to take a look at Lesson 4-4-1, Diabetes. <clears throat> a quick review about diabetes. Um, it's a disease that affects more than 10 million Americans. Uh, it, metabolic problems cause the body to not use glucose properly. Passage through the cells is facilitated by a hormone called insulin. Insulin is normally produced in the pancreas and the islet of Langerhans. Glucose is the primary energy source for the brain. It's second only to oxygen in importance. Uh, the brain cannot use anything else but glucose for its energy. Insulin is needed for the brain to make use of the sugar. Often, definitive care, not pre-hospital care, of patients with extremely high blood sugar usually involves the administration of insulin. Uh, insulin, however, is not used in the pre-hospital setting. Extra glucose that is not used is stored in the liver and throughout the body as glycogen. When needed, the hormone glucagon breaks down the glycogen into usable glucose. Uh, this is called glycogenolysis. Two types of diabetes. Uh, there's type 1, insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. This occurs uh, during childhood. It's when the pancreas cannot produce insulin at all. Uh, the patient always uh, uses insulin. These patients are uh, prone to frequent uh, DKA usually. Then there's type 2 diabetes. Uh, it's non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. Uh, this occurs in adulthood. It's when the pancreas cannot produce enough insulin or the body resists the, uh, the actions of the naturally produced insulin. The patient controls the diabetes mellitus with diet, exercise, oral pills. In some extreme cases, insulin is necessary. These patients are prone to HHNS or hypoos hyperosmolar hyperglycemic non-ketotic syndrome. The gestational diabetes is the onset of diabetes with pregnancy. Usually after the baby is born, blood glucose levels usually return to normal. Uh, but a woman who has had gestational diabetes is at risk for developing type 2 diabetes later in life. In order to effectively use a glucometer, the EMT should be sure to waste the first drop of blood obtained from the patient's finger. This will serve to ensure a clean specimen for the glucometer. Low blood glucose readings are less than 60 milligrams per deciliter of blood. Uh, the normal range is from 60 to 150 um, milligrams per deciliter. The mid-range or ideal levels uh, are 80 to 120. Hyperglycemic is considered greater than 150 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, however, we usually see the DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis uh, usually between the 250 to 500 milligrams per deciliter range. Um, however, uh, your Diabetic patients who um, usually run high with their normal blood sugars uh, sometimes won't hit the ketoacidosis stage until um, well over 500. So you, ne you need to be uh, aware of what your patient's uh, normal blood sugar readings usually are. Determination of the patient's blood sugar level is necessary in order to provide the patient with oral glucose. In the field, if in doubt, Glucometer or not, give oral glucose if the patient is conscious and has a gag reflex. Only if the patient is conscious and has a gag reflex. This will help the hypoglycemic patient, and it won't generally harm the hyperglycemics um, with the oral glucose that is fast-acting, um, but it is also very quickly um, uh, gone out of the system. Hypoglycemia used to be called insulin shock. Um, your patient will present pale, diaphoretic, they'll have an altered mental status, um, they do tend to be prone to vomiting. These are generally seen in blood, blood glucoses less than 60 milligrams per deciliter. Um, usually the altered mental status won't kick until about 40 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, but every patient is going to be different. Some will be altered right at the 60 uh, milligram per deciliter reading. Uh, so you, again, you have to be aware of uh, your patient's usual readings, uh, especially if they have a history of this. The reality of it is this is a hypoglycemic state, not a shock state. 
this can be caused by changes in exercise, uh, a recent illness, even missed meals. Uh, so you have to be careful and uh, get a very detailed uh, history. The treatment for hypoglycemia is oral glucose. However, this is only if they can swallow on command. Uh, remember earlier, they have to be conscious and have a gag reflex. Otherwise, your main concern is to protect the airway. Never assume it is a hypoglycemic episode until blood glucose is done. Um, and it's safe to never assume that hypoglycemia is the only problem uh, that your patient is experiencing. Um, they could be postictal after seizure, um, especially in pe your pediatric patients. So um, again, it's very, very critical that you get a very detailed sample history. When awake, feed the patient a complex carbohydrate. Um, as you can see at the bottom right hand corner, uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are actually uh, a very good source of complex carbohydrates. Um, any kind of bread or, or pasta is usually pretty good. Ensure that someone will be with the patient um, if they are refusing transport. Uh, also, uh, with the uh, uh, detailed history, uh, try to rule out any other problems such as trauma. Um, you know, any kind of a head injury could be uh, uh, exacerbating the issues. Um, but the patient must be fully alert and oriented. Um, as we went over earlier, always contact medical control um, per, per, uh, per your local protocol regarding patient refusals. Um, it's usually um, safe to cover yourself um, and just go ahead and call, contact your uh, online medical control if your patient is uh, attempting to refuse uh, treatment and transport. Hyperglycemia, um, diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, the signs and symptoms are polyuria, uh, frequent, frequent urination. Um, it will also have a, a distinct smell to it. Um, it it'll usually smell um, like acetone. Uh, you'll have polyphagia, they're always hungry. Polydipsia, um, they'll be incessantly thirsty. They cannot get enough to drink. Um, sh they'll show signs of dehydration. Um, these people as well will have uh, pretty profuse vomiting. Um, they'll have an excessive loss of weight, uh, usually within uh, the last week prior to uh, onset of symptoms. Um, they will have small respirations, rapid deep respirations, um, the acetone smell, um, a fruity or sweet odor um, from the patient's breath or skin. Um, usually if they're panting like a dog um, and you smell the acetone, it, it's, it's pretty indicative of uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, they'll have an impaired sensorium and uh, <clears throat> these, these folks tend to go into shock pretty quickly, um, uh, the hypovolemic shock because of the dehydration. Um, even though they're always taking in fluids, they're constantly urinating it right back out. So they're not really getting any of the fluid into their system. And they dehydrate really quickly and go into shock. Treatment for DKA, um, as with any patient, ABCs first. Oxygen, uh, you, you want to recheck the blood glucose, um, check it frequently. Uh, of course, you want to uh, initiate rapid transport. Um, IV boluses will not dilute the sugar within the blood. They are given merely for the dehydration concerns due to DKA. So um, uh, please do not um, misinform your patient of this. Um, we see it happen all the time. Um, it doesn't dilute the sugar in the blood. The IV fluids are simply for um, to combat the dehydration issues. Hyperosmolar hyperglycemic non-catotic syndrome. Uh, this is what we discussed uh, when we reviewed type 2 diabetes. This is hyperglycemia with blood sugar ranging from 600 to 1200. Uh, seen typically in type 2 diabetics where type 1 diabetics see the DKA. Uh, the body makes just enough insulin to keep itself from an anaerobic metabolic state. Uh, because of this, uh, they don't have the ketones. Uh, you're, you're not smelling the ketones, which is what causes that acetone smell. Uh, 
the Kussmaul respirations are also uh, not present with the HHNS. Um, you will still see the polyphagia and polydipsia and the polyuria uh, because the body is trying to get more insulin and trying to eliminate the excess sugar in the blood, um, not the ketones in the DK, like uh, DKA, um, which is why you have that fruity smell, that acetone smell. Uh, you won't have that with the HHNS. Um, but you will still have the uh, excessive drinking and uh, excessive uh, output as well. These patients usually have profound dehydration, again, altered level of consciousness, possibly progressing into acute renal failure, seizures, coma, and death. Uh, this happens usually pretty quickly when they hit this state, so you have to be right on top of it. Um, other medical problems associated with diabetes, um, they generally tend to have atypical heart attacks. Um, and the reason we say atypical is um, they generally don't present the same way that um, uh, your other cardiac patients will present. Uh, they generally don't tend to have the chest pain or anything like that. Uh, renal failure is very, very commonly associated with diabetes. Hypertension, again, very common with diabetes. Uh, poor recovery from major insults to the body um, and prolonged healing. Um, it will take a very long time for wounds to heal, uh, if they even heal at all. So again, if you notice that your patient has uh, old looking wounds um, that aren't necessarily in the proper stages of healing, uh, that's another pretty telltale sign. Diabetic retinopathy occurs as a result of blood vessel damage to the eye. So, um, you know, again, vision, vision disturbances are, are pretty, pretty common with diabetics. This concludes our diabetic uh, lecture. If you have any questions, please uh, forward those to your instructor of record. Thank you.